My name is Kangla Kangaroo, and in this video, I'm going to be breaking down the whole entire step-by-step -step process of converting your TN or your H-1B visa to a green card. I'm going to be covering the entire green card process step-by-step -step in detail, as well as the time estimation for each step. And at the end of the video, I'm going to be giving you some very important tips and caveats that you should be aware of when you're applying for the green card, because there's a lot of nuance to this whole entire process. So a little bit of background information on me. I was born and raised in Canada, and I also went to university in Canada. I graduated with a degree in computer engineering, and right after I graduated university, I went to go work for a company in the States. I came to the US on a TN visa and I'm in the process of converting that TN visa via EB3 employer sponsorship. So it's pretty clear that I'm not a lawyer, just someone who's currently in the process right now. So if you have any questions about my specific case, I'd be more than happy to answer them in YouTube in the comments or, or in the Discord, which I'll link below. But if you have questions about your own case or you're curious how it directly applies to you, I would reach out to a lawyer because this stuff can get pretty complicated pretty fast. With all that out of the way, there are three big major steps when it comes to getting your green card. The first one is the perm process. The second one is filing your I-140. And the third one is adjusting your status through the form I-485. So the first stage is the perm process, which is the longest, and I would also say the most complicated stage of the green card process. This perm stage can be broken down into four steps. Number one is gathering your documents. Number two is getting a prevailing wage determination. Number three is doing a labor market test. And then number four is actually filing the perm itself. Step number one is gathering your documents. In this part of the process, you, your manager, your lawyer and your employer are all going to work together to essentially create a package that you will end up sending to the U.S. Department of Labor. This package will detail a bunch of different information about your job, your minimum role requirements, the minimum education requirements, your role duties, etc, etc. Also during this stage, I don't remember if it's exactly right at the beginning or further along, you will also have to provide your work experience and reference letters of employment authorization from all your previous employers. Now this first stage where you're gathering your documents essentially can take a varying amount of time depending on how on top of it you are and how on top of it your lawyers and your managers are. And if I were to give an estimate, I would say lean towards the idea of months rather than weeks. Now, once step one is complete and you've gathered your documents, the second thing you have to do is get a prevailing wage determination. With this package that you've essentially created with your dream team, you're going to send it over to the U.S. Department of Labor to get a prevailing wage determination. And this document is basically saying how much your employer is going to pay you after you get your green card. Now, to be honest, I don't really know much about the actual prevailing wage determination aside from the fact that it takes a long time. Now, if I remember correctly, this this part took me around six months to get a response back from the Department of Labor. By the way, I'm going to be doing a whole entire breakdown later on when I actually get my green card on each step of the process and how long each step took me like with dates. So if you're interested in that, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss it. Now, after step two is complete and you get your prevailing wage determination back, your lawyer will now use the prevailing wage determination to conduct what's called a labor market test. This is essentially where they will advertise your role to prove that there's no willing, able and qualified U.S. citizen or U.S. worker that can already do your role. From what I've read, the advertise your role for a couple months to see if anyone is willing or able to qualify for that position that you have. And if someone is qualified, that means the labor market test has to stop and you have to restart again. Now, this part of the perm process went pretty smoothly for me. I was able to get my labor market test accepted on my first try, but I've had friends who failed the labor market test and had to redo it until they got to a point where no one could fill the role. So after step one of gathering your documents, step two of getting that prevailing wage determination, step three of doing that labor market test, you can now finally file your perm, which is step four. Your lawyers will essentially use all of the things that you've gathered in step one through three in order to file your perm. Now this step where you're applying for your perm and you're waiting for a response back from the Department of Labor can take a very long time. Like we're talking like a year if you don't get audited. And if you get audited, it could be even longer than that. And I've heard that 30% of cases get audited. So really it's a game of chance. Now the date that your employer files your perm is what's called your priority date, which is a very important thing to remember. And we'll touch back on this priority date later on in the video. So for me, applying for the perm actually went pretty smoothly. I got it within like around a year. So the whole process from start to end for me, I think took about just under two years. And I think that's a good estimate of how long this process should take around two years, plus or minus a couple months, depending on if you get audited or not, or how fast you are when you're getting all your documents and stuff together. Now, like I said, this is probably the longest stage of the green card process and probably the most complicated as well. There's a lot of different moving parts with a lot of different players. So it can get very confusing very fast. I think it's also really important to reemphasize right now how important of a role, your lawyer, your employer, and even in this case for the first stage of the green card process, your previous employers are and how important it is for you to kind of be on top of all these different moving parties or different people and make sure that they're all working together with you in order to move along this green card process. So some other important considerations that I want to say about the perm. Now, to my knowledge, the perm process for the H-1B and the TN visa are the same. Now for people on TN, what I've read is that this 
process does not count as immigrant intent, which is negatively affecting your TN visa when you go to reapply. Now, the reason that I've seen for this online is that technically your employer is filing for all this document and you're not actually filing for the documents yourselves. But again, this is something that I would reach out to your lawyer to double check because I'm not really sure. At this process, I had no problems traveling internationally. But again, this is something I would clear up with your lawyer. Now, another note that I want to make is if you make a significant job change during this perm process, you'll probably have to restart. And what I mean by that is like, you know, if you move companies, that's a pretty significant job change. Or even if you move from one role to another that is different enough that would cause you to refile your perm. I also think that moving states would trigger uh, your perm to be refiled. So something like moving from apartment to apartment within your city is chill, but something like moving from state to state might cause your perm to be refiled. But again, this is something you have to clear up with your lawyer because I didn't go through that process. Now to quickly summarize this first stage of the green card process, the perm process has four stages. The first is gathering your documents. The second is the prevailing wage determination. The third is doing a labor market test. And finally, the fourth is filing for your actual perm itself. In terms of time estimates, I would say somewhere around two years, plus or minus a couple of months. And this process for the TN visa and the H-1B visa is more or less the same from my understanding. Next, we'll move on to the second stage of the green card process, which is filing the I-140. Now, once your perm is completed, you can use it to file the I-140, also known as the Immigrant Petition for an Alien Worker. And from this point forward, you no longer be working with the Department of Labor. You will now be working with the USCIS, which is the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services. Now, once you get your perm back, it is only valid for 180 days. So it's very crucial to be on your game once your perm is completed. And now at this point of the green card process, if you had an EB1 or an EB2, there are probably ways that you can self-sponsor without using your employer. But since the majority of you that are watching are probably not in that situation, at this point of the game, your employer will have to file your I-140 for you for both the TN and the H-1B. Now the processing time for the I-140 is around like four months, but you can actually pay for premium processing, which will cut it down to like two or three weeks. Now I personally did mine with regular processing, which took around three months. And the reason I did regular over premium is something that I'll cover in my later timeline breakdown video. Now for some notes in particular for the TN during this stage, it seems that international travel while your I-140 is pending or after your I-140 has been filed is a little bit of a gray area. The TN visa is single intent, which means that you can only use it for the singular purpose of work and you cannot gain any immigration benefit from it. On the flip side, something like the H-1B is dual intent, which lets you work and work towards getting your green card. So the issue with the TN comes up when you're doing international travel and you're coming back to the US. Now, since the TN visa is only meant for working, when you come back from your international travel abroad back to the US, the border agent can say like, hey, you're on a TN visa, but you have your I-140 pending. They can make the argument that you are showing immigrant intent and might deny your re-entry into the US on a TN visa. To my knowledge, this is a little bit of a gray area because for me, I was able to travel internationally perfectly fine multiple times while my I-140 was pending. But if you go search these terms on Reddit, you'll see conflicting arguments and conflicting statements. Either way, this is something you should definitely talk to with your lawyer when you're going through the I-140 process when it comes to travel, because you don't want to jeopardize all that hard work that you've done with the perm and all that time that you used on the perm by making a mistake on traveling or not understanding the nuances of traveling. Now, if you're on H-1B, I don't think this is an issue for you because like I said, you have that dual intent visa, whereas the TN is only that single intent. One other point that I want to bring up for the H-1B is that once you get the I-140 approved, you can infinitely renew your H-1B. So normally the H-1B is valid for three years and then you can renew it again for three years for a total validity of six years. But once your I-140 is approved, you're able to renew your H-1B in one or three year increments. So quick recap on the I-140 stage. Once you get your perm, you have 180 days to file for your I-140. The I-140 must be filed for by your employer and the process for filing the I-140 for the TN and the H-1B are the same to my knowledge. Now after your I-140 is approved, you are at the final stage of the green card process, which is called the adjustment of status or the AOS or the form I-485. Now, in my opinion, while the perm stage is probably going to be the longest and the most complicated of all the stages, the last stage, which is the adjustment of status, is probably going to be the most stressful. Now, to fully understand the adjustment of status process, as well as why it's going to be stressful for a lot of people, we have to actually take a backtrack and revisit the idea of the priority date. So the date that you file your perm application is called your priority date. You can think about this date as your spot in line to adjust your TN or your H-1B over to a green card. We will use my priority date, which was April 25th, 2022, for the rest of the video in order to make things a little bit more easy to understand. Each month, USCIS releases what's called a visa bulletin to determine which priority dates are what's called current. So for August, 2024, this is the visa bulletin. And there are two main things that you want to look for on this page. The first is the dates of filing for employment based visa application. The second thing that you want to look for on this page is the final action dates for employment based preference classes. 
So first we'll take a look at the dates for filing your adjustment of status. So as you can see, they've sectioned it off depending on your preference class as well as the country that you were born. What these dates are essentially saying is that if your priority date is before the date that we have listed here, that means that you can file your adjustment of status application. To apply my example, I'm on an EB3 and I was born in Canada and my priority date is April 25th, 2022, which is before February 1st, 2023. Now, because my priority date is before what is currently on the page, I'm what is called current, which means I can file my adjustment of status application to USCIS and they will not deny it and they will receive my package. Now, as you can see, if you're born in China or India, the date is pretty backed up. India, especially their filing date is over 12 years ago. Next, we'll take a look at the final action date. What this date is essentially saying is that if your priority date is before December 1st, 2021, that means that USCIS will take a look at your application and can actually make a determination on your green card. So as you can see from my priority date, which is August 25th, 2022, my date is not yet current, which means that USCIS cannot make any action on my application. So in order for me to actually get my green card, this final action date has to go to a date that is after April 25th, 2022. Another thing that I want to mention about the priority dates in the visa bulletin is something called retrogression, which basically means that the final action date or the filing date can move backwards in time. Now this retrogression or, you know, the dates going backwards is one of the reasons why I think that this is one of the most stressful parts of the green card application, because you are so close to the end, but at the same time, you feel like you're so far because at this point, everything is out of your control. And the way that USCIS works is kind of like a black box. Okay. So now that we understand the priority date system, we can go back to talking about the final stage of the green card process, which is filing your adjustment of status or the I-485. If you finish your perm and your priority date is current, you can actually file your I-140 and your I-485 concurrently, which means like at the same time. But if your priority date is not current, what your lawyers will probably do is file your I-140 standalone because your perm has a validity of only 180 days. Up until this point, at every stage in the green card process, these forms have been filed by your employer in benefit for you. But this final stage where you're filing the I-485, you are the one that is actually filing for your adjustment of status. So that means if you're on a TN visa and you file for your adjustment of status, the chances of you getting a TN visa in the future are very, very low because this is a very clear and obvious sign of intent for immigration. At this point in time, when you're filing for your adjustment of status, you can also file for what's called your work permit and your travel permit. Now I have a whole entire video that explains the EAD and the AP in much more detail and you can watch it above if you're curious. So the work permit and the travel permit are actually very important for the TN visa. This is because the TN visa is only only valid for three years. And once you file for your adjustment of status, like I said, it's probably not going to be possible for you to get a TN ever in the future. So you need the work permit and the travel permit in order to stay legal in the country. This is less of an issue for the H-1B because like I said, once you file for your I-140, you can renew your H-1B indefinitely. And while you have your H-1B, you can travel in and out of the country on the H-1B because it has dual intent. Now, after you file your I-485 and the optional work permit and the optional travel permit, USCIS will most likely request two things from you. The first thing is a biometrics appointment. And the second thing, is a medical form. First thing that I'll go over is the biometrics. This is essentially when the USAS says, hey, come to our office. We want to take your fingerprint. You want to take your eyeball scan. And that's it. I got my request for biometrics about a month after I adjusted my status. And I'll have more details on my timeline and what actually happened in the office in my timeline breakdown video. Now, the second thing that they will request is what's called the medical. And what happens for this step is essentially you have to go to a doctor that is approved by the USCIS in order to do some blood work and to get your vaccines updated. This medical form can be sent at the same time when you file your I-485, but if you don't send it, they'll probably just end up requesting it later on. Now, at this stage in the green card process, you cannot travel on a TN visa internationally. If you travel outside the US without advanced parole, which is that travel permit that I was talking about, USCIS will determine that your green card process is abandoned, they will cancel your green card, and you will probably never be able to get a TN visa again because on your record, it showed that you tried to adjust your status to a green card. So again, it is very important to not travel unless you have your advanced parole during this stage of the green card process. International travel is not an issue with the H-1B since you have that dual intent. But if you get your EAD in the mail and you decide to, you know, use it to start a side income or to do Uber on the weekends or whatever, it will invalidate your H-1B and you will not be able to travel outside of the U.S. unless you also have your advanced parole. Also, at some point in the adjustment of status process, you might be asked to do an interview. I have not yet been asked and I don't know if I'm going to be asked. From what I've heard, it's kind of a mixed bag situation. Some people will be asked, some people will not. So I think your mileage may vary. Now, once you send over your adjustment of status papers, all there is left to do is sit and wait. This last stage when you're applying for your adjustment of status can take a varying amount of time. And I have a couple of friends who are a bit older than me and filed for their adjustment of status 
immediately after they got their perm back because they were current for both filing and adjustment dates. Then they got their green card after six months of filing for their adjustment of status. Now this was a couple of years ago and from what I've heard that the waiting times have gotten longer. Now on the flip side, if you're born in India or China, your wait time is going to be much, much longer because of the visa bulletin and the visa backlog. Now for this last stage of the green card process, it's kind of hard to put an exact time estimate on it. UCIS is kind of like a black box and they do a bunch of things without any rhyme or reason. So just to summarize that last stage of the green card process again, once your I-140 is processed and your filing date is current, you can file for your adjustment of status to change your TN or your H-1B over to a green card. At the same time, when you're filing for your I-485, you can also file for an additional work permit and an additional travel permit. If you're on a TN visa, you cannot travel internationally without the advanced parole. And if you're on an H-1B, you can only travel with your H-1B and not with your EAD unless you have the advanced parole as well. So that just about covers each stage of the green card process. I just wanna reemphasize again, Again, I'm not a lawyer. This is just the information that I've picked up by going through the process as well as the information that I found online. Now, even doing research for this video or looking back through my process, I realized that there's so many little intricacies and little timing nuances that I obviously can't put inside the video or else it'd be a billion years long. And I've been being honest, even if I was a lawyer or a lawyer were to make this video, it would not be possible because there are so many edge cases that you can't possibly fit into one video. Now, in terms of total timeline, I think that if everything goes extremely well, you don't hit a single blockade, you don't hit a single red light, and you're very fast with everything, you can probably adjust your TN or your H-1B to your green card in about three-ish years. And I think this is assuming best possible case. Just a quick note, if you're getting married to a US citizen, I think that this process can be cut in half, especially if you're already in the US on a TN or something like that. Now there's a bunch of caveats and some important tips that I wasn't able to actually mention in the video that cleanly. So I'm gonna go over them right now. But before I get to them, I just wanna say that this video took me an insanely long time to make. Like I'm so tired right now recording this. So if you got this far, I would really appreciate it if you like left a comment saying your favorite color or something like that, just so I know how many people actually got to this stage in the video. Anyways, the first thing that I wanna talk about is TN and immigrant intent. Now, some of you might be confused because the TN visa clearly says that it's only single intent, that you're not allowed to derive a green card benefit from it. And from what I've read online and what I've seen is that when you enter the US, it is not your intent to uh, transfer or to get a green card. But after a certain amount of time, you can change your mind and say like, yeah, now I do wanna get my green card. Now this certain amount of time is apparently 90 days from what the lawyers online have said and what my lawyers have said to me. So what that means specifically for my case is that when I came back from international travel, I was not able to apply for my adjustment of status until 90 days have elapsed of me being in the US. To my understanding, if you were to apply for your adjustment of status before that 90 day period, it would be what's called a misrepresentation of your visa. Now, if you're curious about this 90 day thing, you can Google 90 day rule TN visa and there'll be a bunch of articles talking about it. Now, again, I've done a little bit of research on this and it seems like it's a very complicated and contested subject where people will go back and forth. So it's something that you should really just talk to your lawyer about and see what is right for your specific case. Another thing that I wanna note is if you're watching this video and like you just came to the US and you're still undecided if you wanna stay on a TN or stay on your H1B or if you wanna get your green card, I would urge you to still do all of your process for the green card as fast as you can. The reason for this is as soon as you get all of your documentation in, especially for your perm, that's what's gonna set your priority date for the future. I've had a lot of friends who kind of were like, oh, whatever, I don't really know if I wanna get the green card or not, blah, 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 blah. And now they've decided later on, it's like, yeah, I actually do wanna get my green card, but now they're starting way later in the game. Whereas if they had started right away and you know put in their application, they would be pretty close to getting the green card right now. So in the case for applying for your green card, and I guess a lot of other aspects of your life, the early bird gets the worm. Now, just because you file for the perm does not mean that you have to stick through the whole entire process. You can just abandon it whenever you want. But I think that if you're on the fence or you're not really sure about getting your green card, I would still push to do it because it doesn't cost anything besides time. I would also make sure to do things very, very carefully, read over things multiple times and be very active with your lawyers. Like I've caught a couple of mistakes that I've put on my forms and I've caught a couple of mistakes that the lawyers have put on their forms and vice versa, right? Like they've caught some of my mistakes as well. Like everyone in this process is human. So you really wanna take your time and be very careful with these things so you don't mess up anything because if you make a mistake, it's gonna take you way longer to go back and retroactively fix it. Another thing to note is that this green card process takes a long time. I think a minimum of three, maximum of infinity 
right? Now for the TN visa, the only time that you can actually change your job during this green card process is at the very end during the adjustment of status through what's called the I-485 portability. Now for the H-1B, I think it's a bit more complicated than that. I'm not exactly sure about the intricacies of moving jobs while you're on an H-1B. Like I think for the H-1B, after you file your I-140, you have a couple more options, but I think it's an important thing to know that if you're aiming to get your green card, if that's your number one priority, you're looking at three years. And I think that's an important note to make when you're selecting teams that you work for. Another misconception that I see is that you cannot convert from your TN visa to your H-1B, which is obviously not true because I'm doing it and I know many other people that have done it. But from what I understand, it's a bit of a gray area and some employers will not want to convert your TN to a green card and they would instead prefer you to first get an H-1B visa. But the H-1B visa is on a lottery system. So it could take you a very long time to actually get the visa. And the time from you waiting for your TN to get your H-1B is all time that is added on top of your green card process. So if you're from Canada on a TN and you specifically want to get your green card right away, maybe this is something that you should bring up in your interview process to see if the company is willing to sponsor you straight from TN to green card or if they require you to go to H1B first. Now having this green card has its perks, but hopefully in this video, I've kind of illustrated how long and how complicated this process is, especially for people who are born in China or India. So in a lot of cases, it's actually not worth it for a lot of people to get their green card. Now the decision of getting the green card or not getting the green card is something that has very heavily weighed on my mind the moment I started working in the US. And if you're curious to see me play a little bit of devil's advocate and give you some reasons why you should not get your green card, you should watch this video right here where I go over it.